Be the Talk, Episode 136, featuring Tony Michaelitis. Welcome to Be the Talk. We go behind the talk seven days a week for tips and techniques to help you change the world. I'm Nathan Eckel and a talker myself. I'm interviewing others who change the world with their talk. You can too, even if you've never given a talk before. Let's get started with today's show. We are live with Tony Michaelitis. Tony, are you ready to talk? I'm ready to talk. Yes, Nathan. In a career spanning three decades, Tony Michaelitis has long been one of the UK's foremost record promoters, working with artists whose sales are in excess of a billion. His artist portfolio has become a who's who of the music industry, The Police, U2, Genesis, Whitney Houston, Peter Gabriel, NSYNC, David Bowie, Massive Attack, and Dave Matthews, to name just a few. Tony Michaelitis, welcome to the talk. Thank you. Delighted to be here, sir. Well, it's an honor to have you, and uh, your TEDx talk was called Rebels and Rockstars. It's really uh, just kind of a memoir. Uh, It's a verbal video memoir of your best stories talking and working with and promoting the best of the business. So please, Tony, take us behind the talk. Yeah, well, I mean, I was approached by um, some people in Sarasota, the the organizers of the TED Talk, to do this. And... um, that was a great idea because I've always been a big fan of TED, you know, and then they started the regional things. I don't know what year they actually started them, but, I mean, they've taken off all over the world, and it's it's a very prestigious thing to do, and it, it's something like – I have a TEDx um, T-shirt from Sarasota, and if I'm going to something important, I deliberately wear it because people always say, oh, did you do that? <laughs> yeah, those so are great. Get a, get a TED shirt whenever you yeah. can. But the, the great story, the interesting thing was I was working with a company called Magic Leap, which I was one of the first six people. By the time the 12th, the 12th, the 12th came, which was that date for the TEDx talk, um, Roni Abovitz, the CEO, was on it, with, with which is what a quite a legendary talk now, because he, he just came out in a space costume and kind of did nothing really. Um, and he had a couple of kind of, you know, creatures behind him and things. And uh, now it's got, got millions of views because... Uh, Magic Leap is one of the highest funded startups in technology ever, and they're now like over 2,000 people. So it's quite interesting looking back on that. Um, and they booked me, and then they booked Roni off the back of booking me. But what I remember most about it was it was it was amazing because we all stayed in, the, in this Longboat Key um, hotel, which was really nice on the water. And Florida's normally fabulous weather, except that morning it was particularly murky. <clears throat> So I get up early anyway, so I thought before we had breakfast, I thought I'd go down and get a little bit of fresh air on the sea, you know, on the Gulf of Mexico. So I go down, and uh, it was was murky, but it wasn't cold. So I thought, I'll take a dip in the ocean. So I walk out into the ocean. It's probably quarter to six in the morning, and I'm splashing around. (coughs) Excuse me. Then I get out, and everything's kind of a bit kind of nullified in my head, you know. And I'm kind of like this, blowing my nose and, and pu- pushing my ears and stuff. And my nasal passage had got completely not uh, blocked up. So then I'm walking on the beach <laughs> doing this all the time, you know, trying to kind of breathe in and so that my ears would pop. I go and meet him at breakfast, and I'm sitting there, and it's still exactly the same. And I can vaguely hear I'm, – I'm kind of lip-reading for the person sat opposite me, Rony, you know. And then, of course, it comes along, and I'm still like this. So what I remember most about my TED Talk is – I had no idea what volume I was talking at, and I was looking at the audience, and I was just going off like, you know, facial expressions, a laugh here, but I, I really, you know, I, I thought, well, if I, when I tried to talk louder, it wasn't coming out any different in my head, so it was, um, it was a little kind of weird, to say the least, and when I heard back, back I when I stood back later, it wasn't particularly, uh, you know, bad on the sound, but that's what I do remember. I mean, only I could have gone for a, a walk in the ocean and blocked my ears on the day of a, an important gig. All right, Talk Universe, that's tip number one. Don't go in the ocean or the swimming. Save it when you're given the branded talk because you could get your, your eyes and ears and all of that all jacked up and, and walk around feeling like you're at the bottom of a swimming pool for it's the rest funny. of the day. It lasted. I even a week and a half later I had to go and have my ears shrinked. Oh. Kind of, you know, I mean, it hasn't kind of uh, got any better. But yeah, eventful. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, well, great. Well, so you, you've been promoting these amazing artists for the last three decades. Um, how were you able, if I can ask you just a, a, a question, I mean, uh, the whole music industry completely disrupted about 15 years ago with Napster and MP3s and iTunes and all of that stuff. How was someone like you being able to hang on and, and be able to change and adapt, Tony, when so many other people, you know, those those uh, giant empires all overnight were were failing and falling? What what makes you so nimble? Well, it's interesting you should say that, Nathan, because it was 14 years ago this April I emigrated. And I kind of... Um, I kind of go back to when, um, after the Rattle and Hum tour with U2, uh, they did New Year's Eve at the point in Dublin. And Bono said at the end of the night, it's been a fantastic journey. We need to go away and dream it up all over again. So what I kind of did was I did my Ziggy Stardust. I reinvented myself. Um, but the thing is, I'd, I'd, I'd run a, a sizable promotion company. I mean, I had more people working in, in my promotion company than EMI or Warner Brothers or people like that because it was all centered around London. And I decided to set up an operation probably before anybody in the regions and employ people. Um, but the thing is, I, when I was growing up in, in the 60s in, in Manchester, my heroes were kind of footballers, you know, and I, I like to remember them scoring great goals and for fear of sounding pretentious I didn't want to kind of scrape around and pick up what was left but you know when you have an overhead of like 10 grand a month and you're waiting 90 days for the um for the checks to come in for the record companies and kind of bankroll it yourself because I never got any investment and stuff it was never really going to be like it was but you know kind of nothing lasts forever so so I kind of you know if you're a footballer in your mid 40s and your knees go don't expect to play at that level and people say to me, you know, do you miss it? And I say, well, what is there to miss? I, I couldn't, in the business now, I couldn't be me today because mm. when you had a, an artist played on the radio in those days around the country, you had a really good chance of having a hit. Whereas now it's kind of changed totally. And you're right. I mean, the greed of the record industry, Nathan, was the result of a lot of people, you know, losing their jobs. I mean, I, I went before... You know, there was going to be no budgets to pay me, so I wouldn't have been able to pay my staff. So I kind of exited quick, and I had a home in Orlando, so I had kind of a quick exit route. Unfortunately, I got um, a thing called um, an Alien of Extraordinary Ability, which is awarded to a small percentage of people to, for services to music and art. So I didn't have to do what a lot of Brits at the time were doing, which were the dollar was two for one with a pound, you know. So they were buying three-bedroom pool homes, which they could never afford in England. And then, of course, the recession hit, and the property market dipped. Florida being the worst. Um, but I kind of I, I, I kind of came out with, I'd done a radio show back in the UK for 12 and a half years. So I thought, well, they love the English accent, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe I'll do the odd Ford commercial, get a radio show and just, I mean, they call it entrepreneurial, you know, nowadays. But I mean, back then, you know, I mean, I've always called it flying by the sea in my pants because <laughs> in the business i mean my job was here's a record if you get it played you have a job if you don't get it played you don't have a job so it was always precarious to say the least so there was there's always been kind of the the perverse like not knowing what's next I, i'm not a nine to five person and i couldn't sit still long enough to kind of do a job like that so i like to wake up chaotic as it gets at times and i've no clue what's going to happen in the day um, so, yeah, so I came over in, in 14 years ago. The interesting thing was I got a green card nice and easily, but within four months of every grain, three hurricanes, divorce, relocation, um, that was a kind of baptism of fire. Um, but I can't, I'm still kind of involved more on the um, – I've reached a stage where, um, you know, I'm keen to put something back because – I came from a generation of people that made it up as we went along. You know, there's a lot of people going to music schools and stuff now who, you know, when they get out into the real world, there there aren't really the jobs at record companies and studios. So I like to I like to give people a, a reality check and tell them like it is, but also at the same time inspire them because for most people that are alive and around, you know, in the world today, you two have always been famous. They've been famous for 38 years. But when you tell them stories of them playing to 11 people and, you know, and, and, and like it makes them very real, you know, and, and, you, and you look at like, you know, seeing like me growing up learning my trade as they were learning theirs and the determination, the grit and the belief that they had in themselves. So instead of saying to people, you can be you too, 
you can actually tell these people that stories about basic work ethic and certain things that never change. I mean, if you look at U2, you look at, you know, Led Zeppelin, all these bands from like, who were kind of dinosaur in a way now, they did it from blood, sweat and tears. They just went around. There was no overnight success then. It took me two years to get U2 on the radio. No record Two years? Company. Yeah. No record company would persevere for that amount of time. When I say two years, to get any extensive airplay, because... They were doing, they were getting played in specialist shows. So you would take, you know, Bono the Edge in to do an interview that went out at like, you know, 11 o'clock on a Tuesday night and two tracks from the album. But those shows were listened to by music fans. Wow. Well, I mean, it's it's paying your dues, whether you're YouTube or uh, you, YouTube or uh, the whoever's coming out next. We all have to pay our dues. We all have to get the job done. That's amazing. You had to hit the road and the pavement with them for two years uh, before anyone would would play them. I took them into like every radio station. You know, I have a story of taking them into their first radio interview in Glasgow and, you know, saying to them when they were sacking the back of my car, you know, all excited going in for their interview and saying, listen, guys, I can get you in here because of who I am. Only you can get yourself in here because of who you are. Uh, sorry, I can get you in here because of who I know, should I say. Only you can get yourself back in here because of who you are. Basically meaning that I can open a door for you. But once they go in, I mean, there was logic in it at the same time. Because then the DJ would phone me up afterwards and say, oh, great guys, Tony, any time they're in town, bring them in again. So it kind of makes my job easier to, you know, they were articulate, they were personable, and they were excitable kids. And I think that's infectious. It always has been. And that's the way that it works. I mean, that's yep. that's when we refer other people, when we, um, you know, now now affiliate marketing is absolutely huge, but it's that reputation that opens the door. It's And it's all built at the speed of trust. Yeah, yeah. And also they had so much belief in themselves because what the record industry did around them was none of their doing. I mean, you mentioned Napster at the beginning of the show, Nathan. And, and to be honest, I mean, the record industry was – driven by greed. I mean, it took them 20 years to realize there would never be anybody as big as the Beatles again. And then when CD came in and saved them because they were selling the same records to people with disposable income who were kind of, you know, I've got scratches on them from the college years and stuff. (laughs) So the the largest expense in a record is the recording and all these records have been made. So they got the artist to take a reduced royalty and just cleaned up. And then, of course, when the internet came in, like with 8-track and cassettes, oh, that'll go away. Um, but the interesting thing was I was working with this guy at Magic Leap, and he was a visionary in technology like Bowie was a visionary in music. He saw things differently. He would be, in, instead of the powers that be coming and closing Napster down, not thinking something else would crop up, um, you know, Roney would have been exactly the person to phone the guys up and say, hey, let's have lunch and talk our way through it. And then, of course, Steve Jobs just crept in the back door and sold singles, tracks to people, whereas the record companies would make people buy albums with seven songs they probably didn't want. Revolutionary. Yeah, yeah. So, it, yeah, it changed the goalposts completely. Well, the thing, thing is, with with the record companies, I mean, it, it's like, I mean, you 2 and people like that, um, a, a classic case studies because I take those lessons. I mean, I, I, my book is Lessons Learned from Rock and Roll. You know, that's kind of the tagline. And, you know, insights, if you like, you know, and I think the thing is, you know, when you when you talk about bands like U2 and Bruce Springsteen, they become like a corporate message for 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 um, America in as much as let me tell you, Mr. CEO, how to get out of the crowd and, and onto the stage. Let me tell you how to keep your staff, because you know what? These people have been in the same job for 40 years. Have you got anybody who's worked there that amount of time? I mean, the only two of left Springsteen's band have died. So, and they can get jobs elsewhere, but because of the way he looks after them and treats them mm. and, and values their input as human beings, they stay. And, and there's that loyalty aspect. Well, that's not exclusive to music. Never has been, never will be. And I think with, with you two again, I mean, you know, I've coming from Manchester with bands like the Stone Roses and the Smiths. I mean, they, they split up down the line when the money comes in and not everybody's getting a fair share of the, of the paycheck. But, you know, you two sorted that out when they were like 17, preparing for the school disco. Wow. So instead of mm-hmm. waiting when the money comes in and then having the internal struggles and, and people just getting, you know, pissed off about it, 
they kind of get their house in order from the start and decide to share all the money. And when there's plenty of it, there's still plenty for everybody. But it's so important for people to understand, like, how to get their house in order. So I try and, I don't like to use the word teach, but kind of, you know, I, I'm doing some um, coaching courses as well, um, which is basically just teaching people subjects like preparing for success and things like that. Because you look at, like, you know, from the tragedies of Prince and George Michael and at the, at the top level to, you know, to, I mean, even Springsteen suffers from depression and something. You know, that Bennington, you think he's got everything, he's in a successful band, and he's got struggles with depression and dies from an overdose. It's, it's kind of tragic. And I'm not saying that, um, you know, that happens to everybody, but, I mean, when you kind of prepare people and saying, you know, you're getting into this business to... to you, you, your end result should be you want your music to be heard as, by as many people as possible. That could involve um, a certain level of success to the extent of incredibly successful. Have you thought how your world is going to change? And you're all of a sudden you, you're you're out there and you will have people around you that that you know you're their meal ticket, and that will never change because any industry that can attract you know, serious revenue and stuff is going to attract the kind of leeches that surround it. We've been uh, talking with Tony Michaelidis about his TED Talk, uh, which is called Rebels and Rockstars. I believe uh, Stephen Covey said it best, uh, begin with the end in mind. And that's really what we're about to do in the Blitz Round. We'll be right back. People ask, how could I start a seven-day-a-week podcast? It's because of what I've learned from my mentors. Some of the best mentors in history aren't around anymore. They've left hours of one-on-one -on -one mentoring behind in their books. Each month at Classics on Tap, I record a new chapter from a classic business book to help you make a difference. Download your first chapter at ClassicsOnTap.com. And we're back with Tony Michaelidis in the Blitz Round. Are you ready, Tony? I'm ready. I'm going to ask you a series of either or questions related to the actual preparation and performance of your TEDx talk. Here's the first one. Were you selected to speak or did you apply? I was selected. And I, you may have mentioned that. So, uh, uh, <laughs> good, good on me for, uh, for not remembering that. Here's the second question. Uh, are you a memorizer, an improviser or a blender? No, I, I like to improvise. I, I kind of like to – I thrive on being real. I mean, I always say to people, when, when I was writing a book, I said I didn't want to write a book. I wanted to write a book that I'd read. And I think the thing is, when I speak, if you went away and bought my book, which is basically the emotional attachment from a gig, then it's the same person that turns up in the book as turns up live. So I like to keep a level of consistency. So I don't like to, to necessarily know questions I'm going to be asked. I like spontaneity. I always have. Yeah, this is the uh, the cut for time question, Tony. What was the most painful part of your talk that you had to cut out? Well, I ran out of time. I mean, <laughs> I, I, instead of preparing in the way I should have, I realized that you can't really get like, you know, 30 years into like 15 minutes. And not only that. I decided to have a friend of mine playing heroes at the beginning of it. So as soon as I got into a role, so to speak, and there's a digital clock below you, and when it, you see it goes under 10 minutes, it's like, oh, my God, you know, and you're kind of talking quicker and you're trying to rush in. So that was kind of like just my own fault, my own fault. I should have kind of, you know, condensed it. I'm not knocking. It's funny, really, because um, those are the kind of things where I don't sing and I don't play, but I think like an artist because I look back at my TED Talk and it's like now I'm thinking, oh, if I did it again, I'd be so much better. It's like the artist who uh, nobody can understand when they buy their first record because they, the, the track they wrote the latest is, is far better. <laughs> you know? Well, and that dip in the ocean didn't help you either. Uh, oh, dear. No. no. <laughs> From no, what no, you no. said. That, what? that, you could never prepare for that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, unless you had maybe an ENT doctor uh, on site to... <laughs> To, to do their magic sometimes. Uh, Tony, what's a, what's a tip or a technique or a tool that helped you? Um, I've always, um, I've always humanized things. A friend of mine who's a, who's a marketing guy at a top level in the UK said to me once, he said, you know why you were always successful in those all that time, Tony? He said, because 
you humanized it. You made all these artists like they were normal people. So they trusted you and they respected you and they did things for you. And I think that's absolutely true because I've got endless stories, which we've no time for now. But, you know, things where you kind of you just kind of develop a bond with them. And there's times when, you know, they might be a little like not the same. And you just kind of sometimes it's putting their arm around them and say, hey, you okay? do you want to talk? Um, and not leaving them in solitude. I mean, some of these people, they've, they've been on the road for six months and their wife might have had a kid and they'd rather be at home having a pizza and, a, and watching a movie than, than playing to 30,000 people. So I, th- I think, you know, trying to kind of realise that you, you, you kind of, we're all in the real world and we're no better and no worse than anybody else. And you don't you treat them with respect, but in the same way you expect, you know, do us to others, so to speak. And sometimes you have to pull them in and, uh, and, and address certain ones that are behaving badly um, in the same way a teacher would and, and ultimately gain that respect. Because I don't want to risk my reputation being at stake by people behaving badly and thinking they have the right to behave like um, an a-hole, you know, by my language. <laughs> We've been enjoying a very candid talk with Tony Michaelidis, who has been a producer and a promoter to the stars. Uh, his talk is called Rebels and Rock Stars. It was given on 12, 12, 12, I believe, in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, you can go and check out that talk by going to our show notes page. If you don't want to type all that into YouTube, you can go to be the talk.com and we will have a link to that. We will also have a link to uh, Tony's website over at TonyMichaelidis.com. Uh, his last name is spelled M-I-C-H-A-E-L-I-D-E-S, TonyMichaelidis.com. And he mentioned he has some courses already that you could probably uh, check out, and you can even connect to him uh, via that. And we will be right back with the final word of advice. Everyone wants to change the world, but not everyone knows the first step. Before you can change the world with your talk, it has to be selected. So grab the templates, timelines, and tools that I use to get my talk selected at BeTheTalk.com. And we're back with the final word of advice for Talk Universe from Tony Michaelidis. The final word. Um, Be real. Surround yourself with like-minded people and um, look to collaborate. I always say to people that... um, that every, everything I've ever been successful has, uh, at has never been a result of just me. It's always been a result of a collaboration of people. But I can take the credit for kind of A&R in my company by employing the type of people that in the same way when I got my job, I went out every day to prove to the guy when I was selling records at the back of a van in the early 70s for £25 a week that it was the best decision he ever made to employ me. So it empowers you. And I think the thing is, you know, treating, I mean, I've got a great, artist development doesn't begin and end with artists. It's about people. I mean, my little 18 year old intern went on to manage Coldplay, you know, she, she just came for a job. She worked for me for nothing to start with. And then it's a stepping stone. So I think, you know, well, that, that's I, a big I, stepping stone, managing Coldplay after you're in as, as an externship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think giving those people, some responsibility and I said listen I, what, I, you'll come in here and you'll make cups of tea I said but I make cups of tea as well but I can't send you out to kind of work with artists who we've been working for years but I can put you in the car with somebody else to see how it works and then basically it's down to the person to kind of seize the opportunity so I would say that you know uh, uh, you know and, and actually simple things Nathan like being nice and respectful and and, and, and my greatest case study again always in the story of my life being a fan and then working with him is, is Bowie because the graciousness and the humility of the man along with the mega stardom is the most attractive thing in the world you know Tony Michaelidis thank you for coming on the talk and sharing your wisdom today with Talk Universe thank you Nathan pleasure thanks for listening to Be The Talk For tips and resources to help you change the world, go to BeTheTalk.com. See you tomorrow.